Hey, what is going on Guardians? TBL here, and today of course is Thursday, meaning we got the drop of the Bungie Weekly Blog this week at Bungie. And this one is the final one before the next DLC, Warmind, officially drops next Tuesday. And this one is absolutely chock full of fantastic information. So without any further ado, we're just going to go ahead and dive right into it. Now they start things off by talking a bit about some of the updates we got this week. Of course, we've gotten several Bungie developer insight updates with trailers and videos and commentaries showing off some of the changes that are going to be coming in Warmind. Including a video today that showed off the surface of Mars, the Hellas Basin, the Forgotten Sun, Nacris, and even the Worm God Zol. But anyways, as we move on through the TWAP, we make our way to the patch note preview for some of the changes coming in 1.2.0. We're going to go through some of the bigger ones here. First things first, they found themselves a bit of a vault space solution, at least a short term one. Vault space has been increased from 200 items to 300 items. Which means, yes, when Warmind comes out, all Guardians are going to have 100 extra slot spaces in their vault to shove all of that precious, precious loot. Alongside that, we're also getting the multi-emote wheel. You can now configure all four emote options with player-selected emotes. This is something we have been asking for basically since Destiny 1 came out all of those years ago. Super happy to see it's finally being implemented in 1.2.0. Moving on, Guided Games will now also feature a Leviathan Guide Emblem that tracks the number of raid encounters and raids a player has completed as a guide. They're also, of course, adding in a new inventory category that's going to contain pursuit tracking items such as those for exotic quests. This means if you haven't completed The Legend of Acrius, that annoying scroll item that's been sitting in your inventory since this game launched, it's finally getting out of there. You're getting that heavy weapon slot back. And in the first and probably only thing I don't like thus far about the patch notes we've gotten, weekly lockouts for raid and raid lair rewards are now class based. So say you're a player who runs two or three titans or two or three hunters, multiples of the same class. Players running multiple characters of the same class will receive rewards only the first time they run the raid or raid lair in a given week. I'm not so big a fan of that. Basically, if you've got duplicate characters, if you're running two hunters, you're only going to get raid rewards on one of your hunters, whichever one you complete the raid stuff first. And I'm not so big a fan of that. I think that when you've got different characters, regardless of what class they are, uh, anytime you run the raid the first time that week, you should get rewards. If you've got three hunters, you should still be getting three sets of raid rewards. I understand why they're doing this. It's, it's kind of to, at least probably, to cut down on characters' power level grinding a single class up. In a manner that's faster than what they're generally expecting. But I, I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of that. I think if you run the content, you should be rewarded for running the content. At least, you know, for your first time that week, regardless of what class you're on. But anyways, moving on, the only other big patch note preview thing I wanted to talk about was, of course, them fixing an issue in which players would encounter a black screen upon loading into the tower. If, if you're on PC, you've probably experienced that quite a few times. I know it happens to me all the time. Very happy they're finally fixing that. Next up, we move on to a section called Details on Design. We get to hear from John Wisniewski here. Who has this to say? Due to a lengthy update this week, I'm going to keep my section short. This will be the last exotic tease for me. After this week, you'll be playing with all the new changes. And then we get some details on the Risk Runner. For Risk Runner, we gave Arc Conductor increased resistance to arc damage, it's up to 50% now, and enabled it in the Crucible. That's the big change there. Arc Conductor will now activate when the weapon is stowed, but damage resistance will only work when the weapon is in your hands. This was already a strong gun for PvE. We're hoping these changes give it a place in some interesting Crucible loadouts, strategies, and counters. And that's pretty darn big. We got to see that great clip of Risk Runner in PvP now with the damage reduction. Uh, if you're hitting somebody with Arc and they pull out that Risk Runner, 50% damage reduction. So they're not really feeling anything from you. And they're getting increased damage. They're restoring their ammo after they get a kill. And they're chaining lightning damage to any nearby enemies. It looks really, really strong, and I love that the Arc Conductor perk is going to activate even when you don't have Risk Runner ready. So you can take some Arc Damage, swap to it, boom, you're getting that 50% damage reduction and all those other benefits. Great change for this thing. A little bummed we're not hearing about Sunshot. I really want to know what they're doing with that hand cannon, but this is pretty good, and I cannot wait to test it for myself when next week comes around. But after that, we get to hear a bit about the sweet business, the one true LMG in Destiny 2. Hmm, don't know if I should be mad about that. Anyways, sweet business. If you run this gun, you probably just want to shoot forever. So, we gave it a capped ammo inventory of 999. 
It's not forever, but it's a lot. And then, of course, we get this great clip of a warlock with the Luna faction boots basically just stepping in and out of a rift, reprocking that magazine, and just firing forever. You can also do something similar to this with a Titan and the Actium War Rig. It gives this thing like 13 to 15 seconds of damage uptime. It's absolutely insane. And having that much ammo in reserves with stuff like the Actium War Rig, the Luna Faction Boots, or just a Titan Rally Barricade, you're going to be able to keep your weapon uptime just at insane limits when this update comes out. I can dig it. Next up, we get to see some of the Darcy. This sniper rifle now grants four times normal damage once locked onto a target. The exact scaling is going to depend on activity, difficulty, light level delta, and the usual things. But it shouldn't take a master strategist to figure out how this will benefit you in PvE. Any crucible combat snipers will also want to give this gun a try. It's got a 7 round magazine, reduced zoom for closer engagements, and an aim assist stat retuned to be more generous when you haven't locked a target yet for better results while you're drag sniping. And then we get this awesome clip of the Darcy dealing just an absolutely massive amount of damage to Argos, the boss of the raid lair, Eater of Worlds. And I've got to say, that's an insane boost for PvE. It looks like that 4 times damage boost isn't going to be available in PvP. They seem to separate that there here in this statement, if I'm reading it right. But still, 4 times damage boost when you've locked onto a target in PvE, that's pretty big. And I can't wait to try it out for myself. After that, we get to hear some really exciting changes coming to the Heroic Strike playlist, including the modifiers and some changes coming to the Nightfall Challenge Card system. Basically, they've increased the baseline difficulty of heroic strikes to make combatants more aggressive and to make the experience feel more heroic. Additionally, at any given time, the heroic strike playlist will have three modifiers on it. One burn, which rotates weekly, one advantage, which rotates daily, and one disadvantage, which also rotates daily. Here's a quick rundown of what you can expect in those categories. For the burns, of course we've got Arc, Solar, and Void Send, which all deal an increased 25% damage for their matching element. You also take 25% more damage from matching elements for whatever burn is active that week. This is of course the same perk we've got on the Prestige Nightfall Challenge Card system. For the Advantage perks, we've got Brawler, which grants you double melee recharge rate and damage. Whoo! Sounds pretty good to me. Grenadier, which does the same thing for grenades, so double the grenade ability recharge rate and damage, and finally, heavyweight, where you get triple the power ammo drop rate and get this, double power weapon damage. Woo! Sorry, my inner Ric Flair is coming out on this one. That is a massive change. I, I, I didn't even think with the kind of spaghetti code we have in Destiny 2 that this sort of thing would be possible, but triple power ammo drop rate, double power weapon damage is going to be huge. Legend of Acarus was already one-shotting basically everything in the game. Can you imagine what it's going to do to bosses now? I think I am absolutely in love with these changes. When we said we wanted to feel more powerful in PvE, this is right on the money. These are the exact types of modifiers I wanted to see. But where Bungie giveth, Bungie also taketh away. So let's go over some of the disadvantage modifiers we'll be getting. First up, Glass. Player's health and shields are halved, but recharge rates are doubled. So you've got half of your normal shield health, but it'll come back twice as fast. Then we've got Blackout, where the radar is disabled and enemies do 20 times increased melee damage. Oh no. Yeah, you heard that right. No radar, 20 times increased melee damage for enemies. That means thralls are once again your worst nightmare. This is probably going to be even worse than the arc burn light switch days of Nightfalls back in Destiny 1. And I can't help but just turn and look at Bungie and say, I can't believe you've done this. Way to make modifiers more terrifying. After that, we've got Iron, where enemies no longer stagger and health pools are increased by 50%. And finally, Grounded, where players take five times their normal amount of damage while airborne. These are already some incredible changes to the Heroic Strike playlist, and it's actually going to give me an incentive to run in there. If I can just get triple power ammo, oh man, I, I, I would just do that all day. Just run Heroic Strikes and blow everything up with Wardcliffe Coil or Sins of the Past. So I'm loving some of these changes here. Definitely a little spooked with some of the disadvantage modifiers. Be sure to let us know what you all think of those down in the comment section below. But that's not the only thing that's seeing a change when it comes to strikes. Legendary Nightfalls are also going to be seeing something different. Players will now be able to take their rare challenge card to Zer and upgrade it to a legendary challenge card. 
Doing so is going to add more customization options to the card. Legendary cards will allow you to select one burn, one advantage and disadvantage, and two additional disadvantages. And with the exception of glass, all the other advantages and disadvantages that we've already talked about are going to be available on the new Legendary Nightfall Challenge card. Additionally, there's also a few disadvantages that are, of course, unique to Legendary Challenge cards. These are, of course, Extinguish, which returns your fire team to orbit if everybody wipes, Famine, in which ammo drops are reduced by 50%, so base Destiny 2 levels, Match Game, where players must match their damage type to the enemy shield type, Attrition, where health regeneration is slowed greatly and enemies drop health orbs, and then finally, Momentum, where health regenerates only when the player is moving. And along with that, finally, they've retuned the Nightfall score system a bit as well. Basically, emblem variants, auras, and token reward bonus scores have been updated to the following. 30,000 points, 60,000 points, 110,000 points, and finally, 200,000 points. These are all some really incredible changes to the heroic system and the Nightfall system uh, in Destiny 2. I would love to see this kind of stuff added to the heroic adventure system as well. It's actually kind of weird that they didn't talk a bit about any of the heroic adventures and what modifiers are going to be adding or changing to that system. Because I can't, I can't even begin to tell you the last time I ran a, uh, a heroic adventure. I'm pretty sure it was when I had to before I could start getting the prophecy weapons from Brother Vance. But anyways, as far as this stuff goes for Heroic Strikes, I'm loving these changes. These modifiers sound really fun, really powerful, and in the case of Blackout, really scary. But anyways, the final thing we're going to talk about today is the new Eververse system. Now, before you go groaning, they've made quite a couple of changes here. The new system is called the Prismatic Matrix. And I'm just going to read what they put here to give you the best idea of what exactly is coming next week. In the January development update, we spoke of shifting the balance of vanity content in favor of activity rewards, rather than purely through Eververse. We first addressed this balance by adding vanity rewards to Crucible, Nightfall, Strikes, and Raid activities. To further improve the overall Eververse experience, a new feature we're calling the Prismatic Matrix will debut in Season 3. This feature has been developed with three key goals in mind. Give players more control over how they earn Eververse items, offer a more predictable path each week that guarantees access to specific items, and to drop fewer duplicate items. At release, the Prismatic Matrix will feature 10 Eververse items from Season 3 each week it is active. Each item within the Prismatic Matrix is on a knockout list, which means every player is guaranteed to receive all featured items for a given week by the 10th activation. Earning items via Bright Engrams, Bright Dust, or previous Matrix activations will also knock rewards off the list. In turn, each activation guarantees players an item that they have never previously acquired. With your first well-rested level up each week, you'll earn a Prismatic Facet, allowing you one free use of the Prismatic Matrix. Prismatic Facets stack up to three, so make sure you have proper inventory space before earning a rank up on a given week, and players can purchase more activations for 200 silver each. Outside of that Prismatic Matrix, players can continue to earn Bright Engrams each time they level up, and of course they can still purchase those bright engrams if they want a chance to get everything from the Season 3 catalog. So this whole new system is admittedly a little bit complicated, but as I'm understanding it, basically each week that Season 3 is active, the Prismatic Matrix is going to have 10 items that are guaranteed to drop from it. And basically, every time you get your first well-rested level up for the week, you're going to get what's called a Prismatic Facet, which you can utilize for a 1 out of 10 chance to get any of the items on that list. And it's going to utilize the same sort of knockout system that's been added to some other facets of the game to prevent you from getting duplicates. So that eventually, upon getting multiple Prismatic Facets, you're guaranteed to get everything that's available in that Prismatic Matrix. And if I'm understanding things correctly, that's basically how this system's going to work. So you're going to have a free Prismatic Facet. I think it's one per account, so not one per character, but one free one per account whenever you get a well-rested level up each week. Whether or not you'll be able to earn any more Prismatic Facets, I'm not too sure. You'll be able to stack up to three of them, and of course you can buy them with, uh, with 200 silver, if you want to take that route. Overall, it's an interesting way to kind of revamp the Eververse system. I can see it as an attempt to try to give you a bit more control over what you're getting from uh, from Tess. But ultimately, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I would prefer it if I could just spend a select amount of money if I was going to spend money on this stuff and buy a select thing. Like if I want the selfie emote, I should just be able to say, OK, I don't want a chance at the selfie emote. Let me just give you three bucks and boom, I can buy the selfie emote. Anyways, those are my thoughts on this kind of stuff. 
And as a matter of fact, that is going to be it for this week's issue of the Bungie Weekly Blog, This Week at Bungie, the one right before War Mine. Those were just some of the most important bits of information that came in the Twomp, but there's certainly more. We'll leave a link to it down in the description box below so you can go read the full thing on your own. Warmind is dropping next week on May 8th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. So make sure you're prepared and stay tuned right here on the channel where we will be covering every bit of information we can squeeze out of it. Additionally, we've got one more Bungie Developer Insight video coming out tomorrow. On Friday, May 4th, this one's going to feature commentary from design lead Jacob Benton and design lead Ben Womack on the development of the incoming horde mode, the Hive Escalation Protocol. Cannot wait to see what's going to be shown in that. But that's going to be it for this one, Guardians. There's a lot of information in here. I want to know what you guys have to think. Which of these new modifiers is your favorite? Which exotic are you most looking forward to when Warmind comes out? Be sure to leave all of your thoughts on all of this stuff down in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed, feel free to drop a like, make sure you subscribe, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date with all the latest Destiny 2 news. But alright, I'm out for now. Thank you all so much for watching. More Mind's just a couple days away, and I know I can't wait. But as always, I am the Black Link. You Guardians, stay frosty.